This is Debbie, and welcome to another brand new episode of The Offbeat Life, where I speak to inspiring individuals who ditch the norm to live their best life and become location. This week, I talked to Ariel Vieira, who is the creator of Urbanist, which is a Facebook 360 video live guide of cities around the world. Before becoming the host of Urbanist, Ariel was a community builder and content creator for Gawker Media, Vox Media, Foursquare, and Museum Hack. After realizing his true passion for live streaming, Ariel set out on his own to combine his three passions, filmmaking, urban exploration, and history, in order to provide the most unique sound on live video right now. Since starting Urbanist, Ariel has acquired over 30,000 followers and over 3.5 million views in just one year. On this episode, Ariel shares how useless hobbies can help shape your future and how to deal with the discomfort of self. Ariel has taught me so much about live streaming and it was so fun to see him and talk to him. He is such an incredible storyteller. So I hope you enjoy this interview as much. Hey, Ariel, thank you so much for joining me here today at the Nomad Hotel where we're about to eat some really delicious food. <laughs> Can you fill in the gaps of your story and why you live an offbeat life? Yeah, of course. So I started live streaming about a year and a half ago, but my journey to becoming a Facebook liver, where uh, I explore the world cities and its history, food, and culture, um, was a very weird offbeat course because I actually studied electrical engineering when I was in college and then went to community management. And then after community management, I jumped into doing social video for Vox Media, which was a part of Curbed, which is a home and architecture blog. And luckily I fell in love with so much doing Facebook Live that I decided to do this on my own because I want to nerd out a lot more. That is such an interesting way of getting here to where you are now. And you have been nominated for something really exciting. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I've been nominated Best Live Streamer of the Year for the Shorty Awards, which is basically the Oscars of social media. And uh, I'm super excited for that. I have very tough competition, which is even better because it makes me feel like live streaming is really taking off and becoming a pivotal force in, in, in content online. You have done so many things in your life, and now that you're doing live streaming, I'm sure it was really nerve-wracking to do all of these things and know that you wanted to succeed in it. What are usually the first steps that you take in order to fulfill your dreams and your goals? So, so I'm completely 100% driven by what I like to do now. I used to work in a 9 to 5 where I worked all the way, not only 9 to 5, but it would be a 9 to 10 p.m. And I realized I was not doing what I loved. I spent so much time studying a degree I did not like that I realized if I want to live life and I want to be good at it, I have to do everything driven by something that deeply motivates me to do it. And that's by passion. And with live streaming, for example, I just love telling stories of cities. I love the history. I love walking around and talking about food and culture. To me, that is what makes me do that work. And a lot of work for it. You talked about your 9 to 5 and 9 to 10. <laughs> That's a lot of hours, Ariel. Oh, my gosh. Your day now, what your day looks like right now, must be so different than what you had before. Can you give us an example of what an average day looks like for you? So an average day for me starts with researching for my live stream. So all my live streams are one to two hours long, walking through a place that has an interesting story. May it be a landmark restaurant, uh, a park, a neighborhood. And I do, for every one hour broadcast, I may do three to 10 hours worth of research. So it's mostly listening to podcasts, uh, watching documentaries, reading books, etc. Then beyond that is also filming videos. So beyond live streaming, I also make my own edited videos. One of the reasons I am doing all of this is because I love being a filmmaker and I eventually aim to direct major Hollywood movies. So this is all in path for that. So one major part is making these edited videos as well. And that takes a lot of scripting, and that takes uh, planning the shoot, and also going out and shooting and then editing. 
So most of my day is spent either buried in books, editing on my computer and emailing, and then also being out there in the field and, and filming. When I first knew Ariel, we, we met through friends, and he was telling me what he did, and I was like, what, do, what does that mean? I watched you, and I was captivated because you had so much information about New York City. I've lived here most of my life, and I didn't know any of it. And it was addicting, and I just kept watching you. I'm like, what else is he going to say? This is so interesting. <laughs> That's part of the magic of, of uh, live streaming is that you get hooked on it. Yeah. Because the moment you hear your name being said on a live stream from someone, thousands of miles away it's magic you're like wow i want to see the rest of this and also the fact that it's all in one take so there's no edits beyond just flipping the camera when you first started live streaming there's a lot of things that will stop people first of all the main thing that where we all probably think about is do you get nervous because you can't edit it you can't do anything with it it's all live and people will see mistakes and all of these quirky things how did you get over that first hurdle or if it was even a hurdle for you i get nervous every single day <laughs> <laughs> but also i don't get nervous so it's a it's a half half situation because i actually tried vlogging before doing live streaming and the moment i put my camera to my face i felt like I, I felt I felt weird I felt awkward I didn't know what to say I didn't want to condense what I wanted to say in the short spurt and then edit it later it felt so daunting staring at an empty lens in the middle of a public street where people are looking at me so I couldn't do it but the moment I saw Facebook live and I did a Facebook live for my company where I just placed it down and facing Brian Park, and I saw people pop in the comments. Oh, I love this view. Oh, there's a guy walking there. Oh, there's a weird person over there. Oh, I love that building. Then I knew, oh my God, this is magic. And when I faced it towards me and started talking, and people were there with me, talking with me, I felt free. Because I didn't need to limit myself to being pithy and, and speaking very short. I can speak as much as I wanted to and kind of elaborate and go off the cuff as much as I want to on live video. And that's the magic of live video. So that's why I got less nervous. Now where I do get nervous is telling these longer stories. Because obviously, if I'm telling a longer story, it's, it's like, are people gonna get bored? Are people gonna pay attention to? But the moment I see all those hearts and all those like buttons and all those wow faces, and I see uh, all those comments of, Ariel, I love this story, it feels a lot better. I don't know how you do it, but I love watching you. <laughs> we talked a little bit about nervousness, and I'm sure there's a lot of things that you have faced setbacks. What was the biggest one that you have encountered, and how do you usually handle it? I've had many. I have many series of setbacks. One major setback, so I, when I started live streaming, one of the things that makes me unique is that my very first live stream, I had 2,000 people watching. And that's because I knew how to share my videos with major pages. So my strategy is to do a live stream. And when I plan a live stream, I hit up these major pages. And when I started, it was NewYork.com and a few other City Lab. And I just say, hey, care share this live stream while I'm live. And that's how I get that, this, this massive audience. And I got even larger pages. I got Alice Obscura that had a million followers. So I completely boosted in massive amounts of views. But the moment I started going abroad, especially to London, London was my first major city. So to put into context, I started doing urbanist in New York City, my hometown. Love the history. I've been learning the history of New York City my entire life. I had been knowing the street off the back of my hand. But I wanted to continue traveling the world. And the entire reason I'm doing this is to travel around the world and show people cities all around. So I decided to go to London. However, when I got to London, I realized I don't know shit about this city. <laughs> it's not like New York where I lived here my entire life. Or I've learned American history my entire life. Here I was in a new country, luckily same language, but completely new history to learn. New neighborhoods to, to learn from and how to walk around. So that was a massive undertaking. And that's when I felt a setback. And also I had no one to share my videos. So my audience was much lower. But that setback actually ended up being a very important point in my life as a live streamer, as a content creator, because it forced me with a massive challenge of telling the story of about a city that I am not a part of and that it is possible to, for me to provide my 
American New Yorker perspective on another place and make it fun and entertaining and also up most where people can learn from. When you're going through your journey, especially in the beginning, and I'm sure now that you're getting bigger and bigger, what has been the worst advice that someone has given you? The worst advice I've ever gotten from everyone is to be realistic. What is being realistic in, when it comes to what we do? Because what we do to many people feels like completely not realistic. Oh, you're gonna travel around the world and talk about it and make money, seriously. But that is a whole lot of value to people. That is realistic because people have been doing it in TV for years. David Attenborough started as a guy who told BBC, no, let's not just go to the zoo in London. Let's go to the middle of Africa. Uh, and people have been doing this in books also, like Robert Louis Stevens. He didn't say, oh, I'm just going to stay in Bristol, England. I'm going to go to the Caribbean and, and learn about pirates. So I think that what we're doing is, is super valuable. So when people told me to be realistic, I thought to myself, this is realistic, that I am making content that actually helps people in some way. Sure, it might, I might not be a doctor, I might not be an engineer, helping people in a very practical way. But I'm helping people learn about cities around the world. And by learning about cities around the world, beautifies their travel experiences and also helps them kind of escape their lives for just a little bit. And the moment I realized that advice was completely dead wrong was when I got a message from one of my followers on Urbanist who told me that a year ago she, she had a terrible accident and lost power in her legs. And she was bedridden. And she sent me this message, Ariel, because of you, now I can travel. And that just completely like touched my heart. Because knowing that someone who is unable to walk, and she's not the only one, there's a bunch of other people who message me for a myriad of reasons. They have kids they have to take care of. They have low funds and are unable to uh, go to another city, or are elderly and are any, also unable to walk long distances. Those stories, those are the stories that make me realize that this is the most realistic job ever. That I am giving so much value to people and that the opportunities there for me to make a living because of the value I provide is huge. It's also really interesting the opportunities that we have now. So if we don't take that opportunity, someone else will. It should be done. It should be done by people who are really passionate about it, who are willing to go out of their comfort zone and to push this through so that it becomes a reality. And later on, it's a realistic job. It's a real, realistic career. And I was talking to one of the, the girls that I interviewed, and she created this niche that it wasn't done before, and everyone was telling her it couldn't be done. And then why not? Why can't we? You know, what's stopping us? The only person that's going to stop us is ourselves. And unless we listen to everybody that's telling us we can't do it, then there's really nothing to stop us. In the age of online media, since there's no more gatekeepers, it's not like TV where there only used to be 20 channels max or newspapers where there only used to be, back in the 1800s, there used to be 100 newspapers max. That's it. Now you can fulfill any single niche, as you said. Like anything you ever wanted to appeal to someone, you can make a living off of it and provide value to people. For example, there's a guy on Facebook Live who's, who just knits. So old, awesome. He's an older guy who just knits. And he gets hundreds of thousands of views because he appeals to people who just love to knit. That's the beauty of online. I think you hit the nail on the head that some niches might sound completely unrealistic. To me, I've heard many times in my life, one of the reasons I started doing live streaming in New York City, walking around, is because I've always wanted to walk around with friends and tell them about the history. But every time I tried to do that, my friends would tell me, oh, I'm bored. I don't want to walk that long. Who cares about Central Park? So I was like, okay, I'm going to do it on live stream <laughs> and hopefully find someone who's down to join me. I just wanted friends to join me for a walk. That's why I went on live streaming. <laughs> and I did. I found those 30,000 friends so far. It's really hard to stay productive when you're on your own. When you are in a setting where it's an office, you push each other or you have to because your boss is there. You become your own boss. How do you stay productive when you are working for yourself? So my experience was very unique because I was working in the media world 
specifically in the media company that was if you the busier you looked the more people appreciated you i'm not sure if that was completely true for everyone but at least that's how i felt working there so i just made myself look as busy as possible and i did think i was being a good worker so i would slave away hours a day doing menial work on social media that really actually didn't matter at the end of the day just to look like i'm a good worker so the moment i quit and was on my own i actually found this so much easier to be productive now one challenge i find out right now is the balance between doing what you love and making money off of it now when i say making money i just mean to get some monetary compensation so you can keep providing more value to people. And I don't know that balance yet, but but it's it's hard finding it because sometimes I find myself slaving away writing dozens of emails. Most of them never get reply back, pitching to tourism boards while I really want to be outside live streaming. One interesting learning I've learned when going live streaming is that all of my best opportunities have not come from email. They've come from literally bumping into people while I was live streaming. So on my third ever live stream, I did Times Square. While I was walking there, I saw Dylan Thuris, the CEO of Alice Obscura. And I knew him briefly because I wanted to work w- with them before and had a lunch with him. And I saw him and I was on live and I was like, "Hey Dylan, how's it going?" And he ended up joining me for 5 minutes to talk about the history, the secrets of Times Square. And because of those 5 minutes that he joined me around, I emailed the social media manager after that and was like, "Hey, care to share my next broadcast because the CEO was in our last one." And that's how I got them as my major media partner. Uh, and that has happened to me a few other times. So all the best opportunities have come from me doing videos, not from emails. So I always question to myself, why am I writing this email? Though sometimes those opportunities do come through email. You talked about it and you touched up on this a little bit about how you're creating money how are you able to finance it when you first started and how are you able to create some income right now while you're still doing this it's going to be easy for me when i do find the opportunities to get a lot of funds to say oh this is easy to make money off of it but right now i don't i'm not in that position because as i mentioned earlier it's not that easy a lot of companies don't know what facebook live is they don't know the value of facebook live or they don't care because it's not YouTube. Finding ways to monetize is is challenging. I've had the opportunity to work with these brands that are very forward thinking. When I started doing this, I just completely rely on a combination of three things. Being a freelancer, freelance filmmaker, so I make videos for other people. The best jobs are the ones where I'm making an urbanist style video for someone else. Then there is sponsorships. And then the other way is uh Patreon uh donations where people where my followers actually donate directly to me to support urbanists. And I prefer personally to be as supported as much as possible by my followers directly because that means I can cater directly to them as much as possible. What would you say to someone who want to know what they're meant to do or even if they do know what they want to do, they're just afraid to take that first step? To first answer how to find out what you want to do, experiment. literally do everything and anything. For me what it took is uh learning random history. For example, when I was only like 8 years old, instead of going out and playing basketball, I would just spend hours on Wikipedia reading about random history and geography. I would like start learning about the history of Philadelphia and then end up in learning about Nigerian economics and then end up learning about black holes all in one night. And for years I realize this was completely useless because I'm going into engineering. All this time was wasted me learning something that I am not going to actually do for a career. And then when I started doing engineering, I didn't like engineering to be honest. So what I ended up doing in order to escape that, those hours of studying was to start a music blog. So I started a music blog. I blogged for 6 years on Tumblr on a daily basis about music and personal growth. Every single day wrote a post. and I gained 8000 followers. And that I also thought to myself, completely irrelevant. This is not going to help me in engineering. And in the back of my head I wanted to be a filmmaker. This is not going to help me in filmmaking. So that I also thought was useless. And then I tried when I started working as a community manager 
community management, um, where I worked as a community manager for Foursquare and the Gawker Media, uh, talking to people at scale, being warm as much as possible to, to sometimes hundreds of people every single day. Uh, I thought it was completely useless in my route to become a filmmaker. But then I realized when I started doing live streaming, I realized all these things were coming together. All my community management experience was handy once I went on Facebook Live because I finally knew how, I knew how to communicate to people at scale. So I knew how to respond to 100 people and make it all sound very warm and personable. Then I also realized my history, random learning about history came into use because that was my content. And then my writing, my blogging came into use because I knew how to use social media. And also the writing experience helped me gather my thoughts better in my head so I can speak them better on live video. And all that, all that experimentation led to something new. So I think you have to experiment. If you're doing some random shit right now, today, maybe that's important. Take a look at that. And a lot of people might be listening to this working as a social media manager, I assume. If you're a social media manager or uh, someone working in an agency or someone working in, in uh, media, you might be right now looking up best makeup tips and, and constantly looking at makeup tutorials. Maybe that's something important. If you're looking at camping gear, maybe that's something important. All those things can be important. Just experiment, even if they don't seem related. Just experiment. You are so correct, Ariel, because that's what happened to me, too. I did the same exact thing. I did so many things which I thought were useless. And then where I am now with podcasting, it actually helped me with everything. So nothing that you ever do, as long as you are interested in it, is a waste. Because you will find some way to actually use that skill later on. You may not know it now, but you will later. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. You, you, you may not know it now, but it will come in handy later. So I think making that jump from all these so-called hobbies or experiments to making a full-time job out of it is to see what value you're providing to people by doing it. So find something that ends up working. The moment you see someone respond... <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting very emotional. <laughs> the, <laughs> uh, the moment you see someone responding to your content in a powerful way, then you know you have something right going on. Continue with that. I love watching you get emotional. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right. The, the spicy chicken makes you very emotional. <laughs> Let's fast forward 50 years from now and you are looking back at your life. What legacy would you like to leave and what do you want to be remembered for? I love that question, Debbie, because I do that as an exercise to inform how to move forward with life. Because I think if you do that exercise of looking from the future back to the present, you end up realizing what's most important in life. And for me... The number one thing I want to do is to make movies. And right now, that's what I'm doing. I'm making two-hour, one-take movies about history. And if 50 years from now, I aim to make Urbanist the National Geographic of cities and bring it to as many people as possible. I just want to spread wonder to as many people as possible. And I envision reaching maybe 100 million people in the future. Because that's what National Geographic reaches right now. They reach 80 million people. I want to reach 100 million people. <laughs> and I think it's possible. No, yeah, I, I think it's better. I think it's best to have those high goals in mind. So that's the legacy I want to leave. I want to bring wonder to people. I want to have that same feeling when I was little, flipping through the pages of National Geographic, looking at photos of Tokyo and thinking to myself, wow, this is just a magical experience being transported to another world from the comfort of my own f home. I want to do the same thing from the comfort of other people's phones. That will be a really epic legacy to leave. And again, I can't wait to see this all happen. <laughs> So Ariel, let's get to some fun questions. Some people like myself, I nerd out on interviewing, inspiring people like you and hiking. What about you? What do you nerd out on aside from history, of course? Yeah. So aside from history, what I super nerd out on is, is uh, film theory. So one of the things I do on Urbanist that a lot of people don't see is my, my broadcasts are not only about history, 
or simply going live. But to me, I see them as two-hour single-take films. I put effort to having great cinematography in every single of my broadcasts. So, for example, when I go live, the reason people feel so immersed into my videos is because I do specific shots that make them feel like they're literally there with me. One of those shots is what I call the friend shot. So the friend shot is when I place the camera right next to me, not in front of me, but right next to me as I'm walking across the street. Almost no one does that. But that little thing from changing from front of you to next to you makes the person make, make them feel like they're literally your friend walking with you. The other type of shot I do is what I call the wow shot. And the wow shot is, you know that feeling when you look at a beautiful piece of architecture. You're looking up at the Empire State Building. What you end up doing is kind of looking up at it and then looking downwards. You kind of do like an arc motion because that's how the natural eye sight moves when you're looking at a piece of architecture. And I call it the wow shot because almost every time I do that shot on Facebook Live, people click that wow button. <laughs> And, it, and it, makes them, it makes the person feel like they're really there with me because it make, it, I'm imitating what the person is looking with their eyesight. So I really nerd out on film theory because I'm always thinking about what way can I make a live stream feel even more immersive, even more unique, and how can I convey emotion through motion? You are definitely a nerd with that one, Ariel. <laughs> we can all tell. If you were given a one-minute ad slot during the Super Bowl, with the potential to reach millions, what would you fill it with? You know what? If I had only one minute at the Super Bowl, I would tell them some crazy shit about City. <laughs> Let's make a really great one-minute video that uh, feels epic uh, about a small little fact about City. So right now on Instagram, I'm doing what I call hashtag one-minute history, uh, where I just talk about a little thing. Like, for example, today I did a video about the glowing owls of Herald Square. Herald Square, there's these two owls perched atop a monument whose eyes glow green at night. Almost no one knows why. And their eyes have been glowing green for the past hundred years. I would do a video of something like that. Not commercial. I would just make something that is a valuable piece of content for people. And that, that's actually one, one philosophy I have with my content creation. I don't like making commercials. I want every single piece of content to be content. That is such a good idea, and I would like to see that. And you're probably going to get people to visit that place, too, So, especially if you're able to reach millions. What is the most unusual job that you've ever had, and what was the best thing that you've ever learned from it? I want to say, so the most unique thing, the thing I did not even realize I was going to get into is community management. I didn't even realize that there was actual profession to make, to build communities of people. I never knew about it. I completely fell into it by pure happenstance after studying engineering. And that job taught me that there is value in bringing people together. You have traveled to a lot of different places, and I'm sure there's a lot of things that you've learned from that, like we all do. What has been the most life-changing meeting that you've ever had? I've had many life-changing meetings. I'm a person who's easily inspired. It comes off in my videos. To me, everything about life is very beautiful and there's always something deep to learn from it. So a good example would be monetization has always been a, a tricky thing because I always felt uncomfortable with selling myself. The real reason is because I didn't know I had any real value to offer to a brand or to a business or to people. But I know this one friend who is a filmmaker, but he just happens to be both a amazing filmmaker and amazing salesman. From his very first video that he ever made about some soccer team in Spain, he made like a few thousand dollars from. Just like me, I'm a good filmmaker and marketer. I'm very good at marketing my videos and getting my word out. Talking about myself is easy, but selling myself is a lot harder. Uh, so, But this friend of mine, I was struggling at that particular moment, really trying to find money. I had no idea how to make money. But he told me a old Spanish proverb. In Spanish it says, siempre tienes el no. And in English it translates to, you always have the no. Basically means that you don't have to be afraid of asking because the worst answer you can ever get is no. And the moment I heard that, kind of something shifted in my mind. 
I realized one of the main reasons I'm afraid of pitching people, of selling my services, is because I'm afraid that I'm going to get a very bad answer, I'm going to be ridiculed, I'm going to be humiliated, people are going to laugh at my face. But generally, the worst answer I've ever gotten from any pitch is no. And that made me think, it's not too bad to, to pitch myself. I'll just get a no. If I get a no, I'll just keep on doing different types of pitches and keep on working at it. Same thing as videos. Keep making it different ways, keep on experimenting, and something eventually will stick. So that was my most life-changing meeting recently in terms of sales. Especially if you're trying to make money off blogging, traveling, whatever you do. Especially with a lot of your listeners are travel bloggers. Try to make money from that, you always have to know. And if you do it a lot, you do a lot of pitching, you're going to have a lot of practice. And those no's won't matter anymore because the yeses will, will come eventually. And you're going to be really happy when they do come because it's awesome. I feel that happiness when someone does say yes, feel that happiness fully. Take it in. Because I've met a lot of people in this business who just get a success and they're like, oh, you know, it was going to happen anyway. Or, oh, I don't actually deserve it, but it's nice. No, no. If something awesome happens, Debbie, thank you so much for inviting me into this podcast. It's fucking awesome. This is a great opportunity. Thank you. With any other opportunity, always do that. And it also comes more genuine because especially when you work so hard on content, on your work, and I talk about this all the time, a hobby is a hobby until you start making money. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Actually, one great way to think about it is always the difference between a hobby and making money is how much value you're providing. A hobby, you're doing it entirely for yourself. Making money is doing that hobby and finding a way that it's applicable to other people. And that's the thing. What we do helps people. So to make money doing something that you love and it also helps other people, it's more rewarding in that sense. Precisely. Yeah, yeah. It's more rewarding when you know that people are getting value from your work. Uh, But keep persisting on. Like people will come out and tell you beautiful compliments. I think one thing of many people people in this uh, travel content creator space don't do is find their audience because if you find your audience you're going to have people who are going to compliment you you're going to have people who come up to you online or in real life and say oh you helped me so much maybe you helped me so much with packing tips or you helped me so much learning this history whatever it could be or anything in between but how you find your audience is Get your word out there. Find some way on your platform to get people to read your stuff. And this takes guts because you have to feel like you can promote yourself. But if you feel like you're providing some value, and you will. When you make a piece of content, you're like, oh my god, these eight packing tips, they're good. I think a friend of mine might really enjoy this. You'll know that moment. Share that with people. So Ariel, what are you working on today that's really exciting to you? What I'm working on today is uh, I'm making a time travel video about New York City. I'm going back to the 90s today. Now, I can't tell you fully the secrets of how I'm doing that because uh, it takes a very special (laughs) portal to go through (laughs) and some movie magic. But but, uh, it's going to be a a remixed video of an old video I found online. And I'm just going to readapt it as a time traveling adventure. Now, the reason I'm doing videos like that is because I do see what I make as movie making. Uh, I want to not only make my videos valuable in terms of history, but want to make them cinematic. So I'm making more of these videos that are a little bit more looser, more creative with their storytelling. If our listeners want to know more about you, where can they find you? Oh, yeah. If you want to see my videos, go to Facebook.com slash Urbanist Live. And that's where you can see all my videos. Uh, but if you want to follow my personal channels, at the Ariel Vieira. I'm the one and only. And if you want to see all my previous work, arielviera.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ariel. And make sure to listen to our extended interview with Ariel as well. Sign up for that because he's going to tell us how to create live stream videos on Facebook. Thank you so much, Ariel, for being here. Oh my guess my pleasure, Debbie. And I just wanted to say you're doing amazing work by spreading the word of these awesome content creators. Not just myself, but all these other people. <laughs>
that I've heard many of your podcasts, and uh, I love how you're getting these deeper questions and getting to know them better because anyone in this space really needs to feel like they're not alone. And that's the beautiful service you're giving to people. You're making people feel loved and belonged. Oh, now, Ariel, you're making me all mushy and gushy now. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this interview with Ariel. Make sure to visit theoffbeatlife.com. Again, that's theoffbeatlife.com to get the extended interview with Ariel where he shares how to create live stream videos. Love a good audiobook as much as I do? Of course you do. Well, you're in luck because I have teamed up with audible.com to give you a 30 day trial for free. Make sure to visit offbeatbook.com. Again, that's offbeatbook.com to get that incredible trial.